we are recording. Okay, so now I'm going to try to play this uh, this uh, slideshow. I hope it works. Okay, let's see if my mouse is working too. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Well, at any rate, so as I introduce myself, we're here at Siggins Town Castle. I'm going to tell you a bit about the background of it, uh, where we've gotten to. I would say this is almost more of a technology discussion. Um, I have been cooking in the SCA for over 30 years uh, in hearth cooking, and mainly we do it outside. So I will show you the hearths here and explain why I was so thrilled to be able to uh, work in this wonderful building eventually. Even when it was a ruin, I was in awe of it. And, uh, but it's my love of hearth cooking from um, you know, being in the SCA for so long that we get to play in this building now in a period setting. So it's a developmental situation. Um, we've only just started cooking in it periodically since last year. So you're, you're seeing things that are still very new here. Okay, so uh, the background, we bought this castle in 2016. Uh, we, we did look for a few years and the reason we bought it was because my husband wanted to retire somewhere where they spoke English. And um, I wanted to retire somewhere in Europe. Now we're not retired yet, I'm still working. But um, when I found out that you could buy a little castle, little tiny castle, um, in Ireland for something you know moderately affordable, and it was affordable at the time. I will tell you, I, we paid 150,000 euros for it, but it was a ruin, <laughs> so we have to qualify with that. Um, and I, I do think it's a fitting cap. I won't say the end because we're nowhere near the end to 30 years of uh, playing medieval in the SCA and other things. Uh, so we are in Tecumseh, is the way you pronounce that county, Wexford. We're way down at the bottom. And I'll show you a photo in a minute of, of uh, the seacoast. So if you drove down from Dublin, you'd be uh, two hours from the airport. Hope to see people. Hope we like visitors. We like people to come and see and play with us. That's really why we bought the place. Um, the tower dates from the 16th century. So we did have carbon dating done in the vault uh, where there's still some extant wicker uh, in the ceiling construction. And it dates, uh, we're gonna say moderately 1520. That's a little bit of an arbitrary date. And the Siggins family built the castle. They've been here since the, certainly since the 1300s, possibly earlier in the 12th century. Um, there is an attached big house that we're currently renovating. Uh, major construction works there. You can see all that on Facebook. And that was built uh, about 1680. So that would have been post Cromwell and the Jacobs family built that. And I'm not going into a lot of this in detail. Uh, that'll be some other presentation. So I'm trying to just give you a quick background and then we can get on with the hearts. Uh, we do have an attached ruined barn out to my right here. And uh, that was probably built maybe in the 18th century, possibly the 19th by probably the Wilson family. And then we added this new build area where I'm sitting right now um, in 2019 when we started construction. So as I mentioned, uh, we like hearth cooking um, and we've been doing it a long time, but in Ireland, before we actually could play in the castle because we couldn't renovate it until 2019 after we got planning permissions, uh, we would host some heritage week events. And uh, this is us in the heritage park doing a demonstration. That's uh, Master Emerson, George Emerson True helping. He's, he's been along for the ride several times and a big part of this journey. And uh, so he's given me permission to post a few of these. And so he was helping us as we demoed uh, basically hearth cooking in the, in the Heritage Park, which is a great place to visit also in Wexford. And then the other thing we did is we built uh, several mud ovens here on site because I wanted to play with that technology. And that's one thing the castle hearths don't have is a, is a, is a bake oven. Um, so we have a huge pile of clay that we've been making medieval tiles from. And we made uh, uh, these mud ovens and this is, we cooked in them, you know, just uh, last year. So one has survived fine and we'll probably um, make some more, you know, probably a bigger size. So we've been playing with things like that even before we could actually play in the tower. So uh, before construction, uh, this is a photo from an archaeologist uh, report in 1996. And this, I, I wanted this photo to show you because it, it clearly shows the two hearths 
before any of the construction was done that we've done uh, to fix them. And you can see where the, the floors would be on those core bells. Uh, I don't know if I have a mouse here. Mouse doesn't seem to want to work. But at any rate, uh, between those two, the upper and the lower uh, are floors now. But this is a great picture and this shows um, you know, the state of it. It was open to the sky. Uh, so this is a wonderful photo. This is the oldest one we have from, uh, it was published in 1918 in Harper's Magazine. And it says obviously Sagan's Town Castle by the Sea. So it's a misspelling, if you will. And it shows the big house uh, still intact with dormer windows, the tower relatively intact. We don't see a roof on it then. And this is the oldest photo, but we actually think this might be earlier, maybe uh, late 19th century, um, because we have a later one, I'll show you, that it's a lovely postcard. It basically says the castle of Sigginstown ruins, the village band practices in the lower floor near the tower. And the unroofed addition on the right is used as a handball court. And that's the, uh, the barn that's uh, in a much more ruined state. So this uh, photo is 1909, uh, we believe. And so obviously the other one can't be 1918 because the roof's still on. So at, at some point in the late 18, uh, 19th century, it obviously went into ruin. And uh, this is the photo that basically drew us here. And uh, I, I carried this photo on my phone for like three years because we weren't allowed to come see this castle when we first started looking, which was like 2012 and 2013. It was for sale, but it had an offer on it. And so they said we couldn't come see it. And the reason we were so attracted to it was uh, the attached buildings, because after a while, you realize that these towers are very impractical for modern dwelling. And even if you are a crazy medieval person like we are, uh, my husband and I, it, it just uh, is so much easier if you have um, ground floor dwelling. And since we are not getting younger, despite trying, um, we're, we wanted to be able to live on the ground floor. So this building attached um, and this gorgeous picture, which was by Michael Carroll, he is a stonemason. In fact, he is our stonemason. <laughs> and he's pretty much put this tower and uh, place back together. He and his entire family. So he's also a, a you know, amateur photographer. He takes these wonderful photos. I had seen it on the internet. We had never come to see it. And I just carried this photo around because it was so gorgeous with the horses and the very sort of fantasy-like ruin. So uh, another last photo, uh, also by Michael Carroll, and it just shows the, the tower and the house from a different angle before construction. We do have uh, three lovely fields. So one good thing about buying this place is was um, there, there was five and a half acres. We could play uh, and do things in it, but it wasn't so much that was uh, impossible to maintain. Uh, luckily, we have sheep out here uh, today, and they keep the grass uh, you know, mowed well. They're not our sheep. We don't keep cows either, but we're very happy for the farmers to put them on the fields and keep, the, you know, keep them trimmed. So that's all before construction. I'm just gonna show you this last uh, photo in context because it's, it's kind of important to know that this is one of many towers that would have been along the south coast of Ireland. And a whole nother presentation will be about, uh, you know, 16th and 17th century piracy and sea trade, um, because we're right on the South Wexford coast. And so this is actually from far away. This is not at the top of our tower. Uh, I think we are actually number five. I, I forgot to look up which one we were. <laughs> uh, this was Mick again, taking it from Fourth Mountain. So we are number five, I believe, and that's Tecumseh Lake. Uh, you can see a little bit of a lake, which has a lot of um, wildlife, sea, seafood. It used to be totally open to the sea. So there's a lot of documentation about all the fishing that would have been done here, all the salvage, all the trade. So the boats from Wexford would have come around from the left-hand side of this photo and gone straight by. And you can see them very clearly from the top of the tower as they're going by on the next port, which would be Waterford. So there were many towers here. Not all of them are still there, but, um, but we are lucky to be one of them. So one last photo, that's the other side of the castle before the construction started. Oh, 
one last photo. I guess I put in more. So when I said it was uh, open to the sky, I really did mean that. This is the very top of it. This is what we uh, encountered. And in fact, we did not go out onto this parapet at all because it was way too dangerous. Uh, a beautiful photo, but you can see that it was very much a ruin. So uh, in 2018, we got planning permissions to reconstruct, um, I wouldn't say reconstruct, to, to work on the castle. And we did intend to make the tower as close to the original structure as possible. And the house is much more modified in a sort of more contemporary setting um, attached to the tower. So that's my husband, Gordon, otherwise known as Griffith, Griffith Belwin in the SCA. And he's sitting there um, in the, this is the lower hearth room before we did a lot of the construction. You can see that the, um, the, the ceiling though has been put back in. So this was a, a very dangerous operation. Uh, thankfully, we had uh, expert people like this man, Ed Byrne, who's a, a traditional building consultant, putting these beams in. We put the roof on in uh, end of uh, 2019, and then they started putting in the floors because obviously impossible to start using these hearths, especially the upper one, if you have no floor to stand on. So uh, that, was, that was how we did it with these large oak beams that we had cut from a forest in Carlo. Uh, just a, a very kind of panoramic uh, photo. This is the upper hearth room. And it's you know, it weirdly showing you know, three or four of the walls because it's panoramic view. But again, sort of in the middle of construction. I'm gonna try to play this video. I'm hoping it's gonna work. Ooh, maybe it's not. There we go. Yes, there's there's no audio. Audio. Sorry. Sorry. No audio. No audio. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. It's uh hmm. It's always tricky when this goes. I can hear it. It's on speaker, but um okay. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, I will sort of narrate it <laughs> and um I apologize for that. I hadn't realized it wasn't uh, it wasn't going to play. I can hear it, but obviously you can't. So I'll narrate as we go. This is from 20, uh, this is from 2019. We were, we had done the archeology span there and I'll, I'll play it as you can see. Uh, I'll just kind of talk about it. Maybe. So I'm pointing to the level of the clay floor that was in there. There was, um, there was just a clay floor at the time. We didn't find any evidence of uh, hearthstones or flagstones or anything else. So this is before we put down an insulation layer and uh, we had found some trowels at the time so that we had buried there the year before by mistake during the archeology. span So I'm going to stop this because you can't hear all the audio, it'll speed it up, but I apologize for that. So that's a, a video of uh, about 2019, um, okay. Now, this is the same problem. Let me just see something. Um, I don't think, all right, I'm gonna play it again. What's going on here, and I'm gonna explain a few things, is that we are trying to clear the chimney. Uh, and this actually took us a couple of years to do. Uh, obviously not um, every day, <laughs> but we, we started playing with it, trying to uh, clear the chimney because all of the orifices, if you will, of the castle, the garter robes, the chimney and this oubliette chute, this uh, sort of secret chute, they were all filled with rubble. Uh, somebody had you know, gone to some great trouble to dump a whole bunch of stones down every single one. And so that was no mean feat. So I'm gonna just play this, but I understand you can't. So we'll just watch this and this is Gordon and we have this very long chimney, um, a uh, pipe cleaner, basically, that's coming up the stairs. And Gordon is, we're, we're trying to basically loosen all of the rubble that is up there. And so uh, we tried from below, we tried from above, 
I would stand there and jump up and down with it. Um, we do see some debris coming down here, and um, but it was not successful. <laughs> uh, first few times, not at all successful. So I'll stop that. That's, we don't have very many videos on here, luckily. So basically what you see on the left-hand side is um, the same big long pipe cleaner. I mean, this thing is like, I don't know, 30 feet long or something. And it's, and it's in a gap next to this very large stone that is in the chimney blocking it. And not only is that large stone blocking it, there are a lot of very large stones on top of it. So uh, we did finally get the chimney clear with some help of uh, our friends who are the Siggins Town Sloggers, we call them. And uh, it was a dangerous operation. We had to keep kind of peering up the chimney with hard hats on and standing back and hoping that we could get the rubble out. And uh, you can see here that the chimney is in fact clear. And this is one of the very large stones that finally fell at the end, uh, broke that you know, one inch oak board you know, nicely, almost in half. And uh, it was, we were very relieved because obviously we can't not use these hearths without clearing the chimney. Uh, at the, after that, <laughs> the, the crows have been in this building for the last 200 years or, or more perhaps, but um, we, they kept wanting to go back in. So as soon as we cleared it, you know, they would fly by and they would drop more twigs down there. So we, we basically had to lean over the top uh, this is one of the challenges we're going to talk about uh, very shortly is the chimney is not fully repaired. So it's kind of like this scoop right now and it brings in all the weather, uh, the rain and the damp. So we've we put a bird proof grating over that to keep the crows out. And then uh, one of the last things we did before you see it in its current state is we plastered in there. So we decided to keep the main uh, huge stone lintels in place free of render. But this is lime mortar, lime plaster basically being put on in the room so we can turn it into more of a 15th, 16th century uh, dwelling. Okay, so now we'll, we'll talk about using the hearth. So um, this is me <laughs> in, in garb, un, unlike today. And uh, we're, I'm at the bottom of the tower door and uh, I'm welcoming you in. So in order to get up to the hearth, you have to climb up these uh, rather steep stone stairs. But uh, luckily now we have these lovely handrails that have been installed. So this is actually the upper hearth room and um, I'm showing it to you first because most of our, our cooking photos are all about the lower hearth room. So as I showed you in the very beginning, these two hearths directly stack on top of each other. And uh, what we're doing here is, is not cooking obviously, although um, uh, Eod from Dublin did um, uh, try to light a very small fire in this hearth a couple of weeks ago, which we'll talk about shortly. So um, basically it's just to show you kind of how far we've come at this point. So these rooms have been plastered and we're, we're working on some medieval painting. This is actually a later period room. This would be uh, the decoration basically dates from say 1600 roughly, and we've taken all of these uh, motifs from period sources. Um, we have a lot more painting to do in this room, although it looks, you know, cool, I'll say. Uh, there's a lot of detail still to be added on all those um, little uh, dolphins and shells, and all along the top border is, are scenes of the sea, and that's uh, Mistress Morwenna Crew, who some of you may know in the SCA, also a longtime member. She's um, been coming over and she'll come over again in April to finish a lot of this painting with me. Uh, a Shakespeare quote along the top and uh, a, a lovely map of the South Wexford coast. So what you're seeing there is the sea and that's the outline of the coast from a 1610 map along with a lovely mermaid. So um, last, August and September, it was, you know, a nice summer. Now, normally here in Ireland, you may think of Ireland as always cold, wet, and windy, but actually we're here in the sunny Southeast, uh, which we were delighted to hear about. And we laughed when they told us that, you know, because we didn't think there was such a place in Ireland, but, uh, but there is. And so actually this, this climate is very uh, temperate. It would be um, typically 60 degrees, 50 to 60 degrees, and then dropping to like 40, 40 to 50 in the winter time. 
So the big difference though, is it's very, very damp. We're right by the coast, salty air. And, um, but in September, and when we filmed this and when we took these photos, um, you know, it's obviously the end of summer. So the building had a nice chance to dry out. Um, so we were successful in lighting the hearts. We lighted it, lit it first uh, with just some friends to see that it would work at all. <laughs> and we were delighted to see that it did. And then on September 14th, which was Griffith's birthday, we, um, we did some filming with the film crew here and we actually uh, cooked a little mini feast on the fire. So that was, uh, that was thrilling for all of us. So what, what you see here is basically on the left uh, is the hearth in action and the current uh, painting in the room, which we will finish. This is again, Master Emerson. And um, I do have a video of him, but again, we'll have the problem with the audio. So I apologize on that. Um, we'll, we'll go to that, I think it's next. So I'll play it. Um, and it, it, basically what you're gonna see here, it's a short video is that the film crew is here and they're talking to him and hopefully in about a month or so, maybe a month to two months, there will be a uh, television episode on Irish television. Uh, the Great House Revival is the name of the show. And they've been filming us since uh, 2019. So this is the film crew here trying to kind of capture this, which will probably be in the TV episode, I would imagine, because it was a really cool you know, moment. And um, they're interviewing him about, you know, what it's like to cook in the hearth. So I'll play it and then I'll try to narrate. Just a quick question um, to my tech support. When I talk over the video, it, is it garbled? Are you hearing anything of the sound interfering with my explanation? No, we're not. We just hear okay. you, Liz. Okay, thanks. Uh, at least there's that, you know. <laughs> I just have to keep the... Uh, the voice is in my head <laughs> outside of the mouth. So let me try to play this now. So Emerson is saying in the back, he's doing a fish chowder. And we did it because the flag, the fisheries local action group had actually uh, given us a grant. They had given us 40% of some of the repairs on the castle. So we felt it was only fitting that we do a seafood chowder as one of the first meals. So you're seeing uh, the film crew, the rest of us, my daughter, her boyfriend, uh, Mistress Morwenna, and her husband, Robert, and Griffith in the background. So they're filming and we're waiting. So he's basically explaining historically what he's doing. And uh, we do have a small little roast in the, on the spit. And um, one of the things that we found ergonomically as we, as we played with this fire was basically that you can see, um, we're, we're still on a raw floor here. You can see where he's sitting is on a little stool and that's, a, it looks like concrete. It's basically this Leca lime and, uh, and clay mix. And so we don't have the finished floor down. So the stool should be up a little bit. And then we do have this large flagstone in front of it, which is the hearth basically. Um, so it's great for protecting the floors, um, which isn't a concern right now because we don't really have one, but it also ergonomically is a challenge because you're trying to kind of get over this uh, flagstone right now or sitting on the flagstone and then you have to go down into the hearth because we, we, when we built the hearth back up, it was very ruined and we didn't, we basically built it to the level of the current floor and not the flagstone. So that's something we're gonna to have to think about going forward. Um, one of the other things that Emerson found and we found too is because we've played in the SCA and we play always outside, you know, I, uh, well, basically we, we can get around all areas of the fire. So we usually build a big, you know, like three or four foot long fire pit and then we can walk all the way around it and do whatever we want. We have three or four stages. Now, this is a fairly wide hearth. This is about um, six and a half feet wide. Um, and, it's, and it's maybe two and a half feet deep. But you can obviously not get around to the back of it. You have to be, always be in front of it. So that was a learning curve for us. Um, we basically treated this first, this first time as a learning experience. And we just, you know, I took a lot of notes and I said, okay, how did this work? You know, what, what do we want to do next time, et cetera. So um, this is uh, Nick and Emerson, you know, they're spitting the meat. I had actually bought this spit um, 
I have one back in the States, but I bought this from some Viking reenactors. Uh, I call him Jimmy the Viking blacksmith because they were demoing a, a Viking thing down in Wexford and he had some of these um, wrought iron things that he was using to keep the crowds away. And I said, hey, wait a minute, those will work as spits. <laughs> Can I buy some off of you? So I did buy three of them and that's actually what we're, um, what, what I've been using up to this point, but this is a different spit um, that, that I bought after that. So we're spitting the meat and we did actually cook it. So I, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but it's just kind of behind the scenes. We were so busy this day because of the film crew and filming other scenes that we didn't really have a lot of time to prep for this. So we had kind of put all our food out down here, uh, sort of ready and the things ready to go. And then around four o'clock, we're like, okay, change into carb, run up there, let's get this thing going. And so we didn't light the fire until five o'clock. So anyone who's done hearth cooking knows that, you know, you, you need coals really to cook. And so we're sitting here, it's five o'clock. We're going, oh my God, when the heck are we going to eat? So we did actually eat at around seven. Luckily, we were very small roasts. Otherwise, we wouldn't have eaten at all. We were doing no baking. So, so it was okay, but it was a lesson learned. But, you know, that's just cutting it way too close. Uh, so this is the current setup of the hearth. I just uh, kind of um, uh, took a photo of this a little while ago. Uh, one of the things from a technical perspective is um, that there's a hearth crane in there. Now, this is not a medieval hearth crane. This is probably from a 19th century, typically, um, you know, cottage that there are lots of in Ireland. So we got this from Fanine, our blacksmith. And so we've mounted it in there and I'm thrilled with it because it's, it's a really big crane. It can hold a lot. It's mounted, uh, you know, up and below. But one of the things, you know, I'm not really used to working with a hearth crane, certainly not something this size. So immediately what we found is sure, you can hang things on it, but if you swing it out, it's gonna interfere with the spit or other things that you might have there. So that's gonna be a, another learning curve for us is sort of using the crane, deciding what we actually wanna hang on it. I have a lot of large cauldrons that don't need to hang. And um, you know, being able to kind of lay this out in a front forward fashion. Now, uh, let's see, uh, two weeks ago, talk about learning curves. So two weeks ago, um, there was a Cook's Collegium here in Insula Draconis, uh, which is uh, basically Britain and Ireland and Iceland here in Drakenwald. And oh, by the way, we originally joined the SCA in Drakenwald uh, a long, long time ago. So uh, we invited a few friends down. Uh, this is Agnes and Aod and Griffith there and uh, a mundane friend, Doreen. And we said, hey, you wanna do this Cook's Collegium thing? Let's, let's try lighting the hearths. We could do a few things, we can have some fun. So they said, sure, come down. Well, this was um, February, okay? <laughs> That's a whole different kettle of fish than, um, than September when the, uh, the winds are not blowing the chimney was not wet. The temperature is not cold, and it was co it's cold in this. It's cold in the tower. We were uh, Doreen and I were trying to do painting. You know, she finally froze after about uh, half an hour or something and had to go back. So it's not it's not like Connecticut. It's not like uh, Pennsylvania where we've got snow, but it's still a damp cold and it's pervasive. So um, this is us eating in the room after. We tried to light the fire for about two hours. Now we, we did successfully light the fire in that hearth, but the big difference this time was that we could not clear the room of smoke. And I don't have any photos of the, the smoke filled room. You'll just have to believe me that most of the time we had to stand outside the room in the stairwell because it was like billowing, choking smoke. Uh, and one of the problems was that I showed you that earlier photo, the chimney is scooped out. So there is um, this wind that typically blows from the Southwest, you know, coming from the, it's not really coming from the States, but it blows from the Southwest. It comes across, uh, we're here on the Southeast coast and it goes right into that chimney. So like today, it's very blowy, windy day. And that, that wind basically comes down the chimney because the chimney's not built up enough. It came into the hearth, blow out of the hearth, and then it went, continued down the stairs. So um, we had a little bit of this problem in last year 
in uh, 20, what was it, 2021. And um, when Emerson first lit the hearth, it was, he was, it was very much uh, in the front part of it. And I said, you know, I think you have to be towards the back. So it's going to go pull up the chimney. Well, so when we did that, um, and the other, the other problem we had at the time was the top of the tower was open. Uh, the door had been left open because they kind of thought, oh, some ventilation would be good. Well, no, it was not good at all because again, that stairwell being a circular staircase just creates this second chimney that the wind goes down. So we closed the door at the top in September and that fixed everything. Uh, we opened a couple of these small window loops that we have, got enough ventilation, it was fine, the fire burned great. The difference here is that we have not lit it uh, and we're in, after winter and the amount of mildew that you can see coming into the building after it has not been used or even you know entered in a couple of months, you can see the mildew uh, starting to form on the walls. So that's another challenge uh, to fix, you know, because it's going to affect the painting in some places. And um, we're going to have to deal with that. So we've, we basically have to get better windows, which are very temporary at the moment. But the big deal here um, in uh, a few couple of weeks ago is we could not solve the problem. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna say is that all of the logistics of the house have changed. So in September, we had a house that was totally open to the sky. Uh, it had no roof on and no windows and doors. And so it's just a big shell. We had a, a, a door at the top and a door at the bottom. And then once we kind of closed those, we were fine inside. There are no internal doors um, in the tower currently. So that was another issue. If we, I think if we still had an internal door, you can see on the left behind Agnes's head, that's the stairwell. I, it would probably help with this problem, but the big problem was the wind uh, just coming down. We, we could not solve that. So, you know, I look at these things as kind of like when you fail, you learn. And this is one big living history experiment for us, you know, learning about it. So sure, we, we said, look, you know, we've been doing this for two hours. Let's just go cook in the kitchen and then we'll come back up and eat up here. So we had a lovely time eating. Um, we didn't light the fire again because it was way too smoky and we'd already had enough smoke, but we learned. And that's, you know, the purpose of our activities here. Uh, so again, uh, I think I took this today, another, another picture of the hearth. And actually uh, I did a video here and I'm not sure that it, Okay, so we're in the lower hearth room and I was basically talking about some of the ergonomics with the spit. You can see the, the mechanics. So right now the spit is sitting there in those uh, andirons that we've got. And it doesn't, it's not gonna work like that. We're gonna have to reconfigure it. So those andirons go out and we're probably gonna have to get a larger or different spit. Uh, we may actually have to lower it. These uh, were and irons and a spit that we got from um, Irish Arms, a historical, um, a historical company. So I'm gonna stop this. So in this video, I'm just basically talking about the ergonomics, which I've already explained, where the, you know, we, we're kind of sitting on the flagstone, but we have to go down into the fire. So one of the things I wanna do is basically probably have Fanine, who's a blacksmith, build a grate that we could build um, the fire on top of, but then perhaps flip up and then be able to clean out the ashes. So it would raise it. The other alternative is we could ask Mick, who's the mason, uh, to come back and build the hearth up. But you know, for a fire perspective and a place to collect the ashes, we kind of like it being lower. Um, just on that point, the upper hearth room, and I don't know if you noticed this in the photo, we really agonized about the fire protection issues because in that floor, it's, a, it's an oak floor, you know, and we have oak beams under not, underneath. And so there's all sorts of modern fire codes about, you know, open fireplaces and distances from the oak floor or the wooden floor. And so we decided the only way to do that was probably to build up the hearth. So that's actually about six inches above the floor level. So there's plenty of distance, plus there's a hearthstone in front of it.
but um, so there's no there's no contact with any wood in in that hearth, and so it's a lot taller. It's also a lot shallower. So we're going to see how the ergonomics of that hearth, which I probably plan to use for probably baking, uh, maybe much smaller activities. Um, or maybe heating uh, drinks, et cetera. And most of the main cooking is gonna be done here. So uh, I'm almost at the end here, almost ready for questions, uh, discussion. So considerations, um, you know, I, I talked about this uh, in lighting the fire. Uh, I didn't have the, the network today, so that was a, a moot point. But again, this would have been a terrible non-starter again. Uh, we did actually post on Facebook about our about this problem a couple weeks ago, and had lots of uh, people offering suggestions. And but the be the best one is from our neighbor Jim, who is at Butler's Town Castle, uh, only a few kilometers down the road, and you know he's been living there for decades. And he said, "Well, when was the last time you you lit the t lit the fire?" I said, "Oh, September." He goes, oh, "Okay, well, you know, it's it's damp and it's cold." He goes, "You have to load up a ton." of paper, he's like this. He goes, you have to pretend like you're gonna burn down the tower with this paper and you let it rip and it's like a roaring blaze and you'll see it change. You'll see it with the smoke coming out and then all of a sudden whoosh and you're burning all the damp out of the chimney. So we're gonna try that <laughs> next time uh, when we're ready to, to, to make another go of it. And we're also hoping that um, you know we're, the weather will just get a little drier uh, as the spring comes. Um, we do have this wind, and so until the chimney is actually fixed properly, it, we still have this scoop issue. So we may we may put a temporary kind of sort of cover on it, just even an aluminum cover or something metal. Um, or hopefully later on this summer, we're going to get back up to the parapet and uh, keep working on the chimney. So the tower is not lived in. Uh, you know, in medieval times, obviously they would have keep, kept uh, kept it going all the time. You know, because obviously you don't want this to happen. Um, it would have been much drier in there, at least in those two floors where they have hearths. And in general, the building would have had mass, you know, mass heat. The one advantage I think we have now is that because we have this attached house on one side of it, and that house will be lived in, and it will have some heating in it, it'll probably never be warm, um, that's going to help that north face of the, uh, of the tower. So it, it should help it dry out a bit. Um, now we are going to have to learn more about the draw of the chimney, the stairwell, the windows, uh, when we get doors on it, you know, and just like what the formula is for keeping uh, the fire lit and getting it going. Um, some other considerations, we don't have water yet in the tower. Um, we're working on it with a plumber. We have these little tiny garter robes, which are two feet wide. So anyone who comes to visit us can kind of hopefully at some point like fit into those little toilets, medieval garter robes which we think are the, one of the coolest things in the castle. Um, but we don't have running water or toilets at the moment. And so anything we bring up, have, we have to clean up. Uh, we don't have you know, any medieval looking garbage uh, you know, can, <laughs> which we will have. But, uh, and we're not using the garderobe chute anymore for, for that sort of thing. Uh, the ergonomics, which I've already mentioned, you know, just uh, we have some medieval tables in there, reproduction. Um, but you know, as as any cook knows, you want to work at a comfortable height, and so you know, getting a couple of different worktops in there for um, for standing or for sitting. Um, our tool layout, we already talked about that, and then the the real exciting thing, maybe we'll do that this year, is using both hearths at the same time. So that'll be a whole nother technical kind of experiment. Hopefully, we'll do that later on this summer. Um, so I, I actually just took this from Apple. We did not cook this, but it was, it looked pretty medieval. So I said, I'll just keep it on there. Um, this is just our Facebook page and, uh, you know, our website, which is not entirely up to date at the moment. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, what we're going to do just, just to understand the context of this is we are going to open for tourism, hopefully on May day. And that might, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have uh, Mistress Morwina over and she's going to be painting. So we're going to open for paid tours. We've been doing free tours for the last five years, basically six years. Um, and that's not a problem, but because we took a grant for the reconstruction of the tower, 
we have to open as a business. And so we will start doing paid tours um, periodically. But the other thing that's more interesting to us besides just doing these tours is doing, you know, letting people feel what it might be like to live or be in a castle when it's being worked. So, you know, sort of living history, um, doing maybe a medieval supper. You can see that this room is not very big in either one. So we could probably fit, you know, ideally a dozen people or so at a medieval supper or having an Elizabethan banquet where we just have, um, you know, cold sweetmeats on a banquet table and really talking about the history. So I've got about 90 ideas written down in a book and we'll start doing some of those, but the first things will be uh, the tours. So thanks very much. I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'm happy to answer any questions um, that I can. <laughs>